You're now listening to Alpha Leak, a podcast mini series highlighting the most under the radar projects and developments in crypto. And this series is brought to you by the Blockcrunch Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Choi. I'm a general partner at Spartan Capital and an active DeFi angel investor. Nothing on this show should be construed as financial advice, and my guests, myself, and my employer may hold positions and assets discussed on the show. And if you'd like for your project to be featured on this series, reach out to me on Twitter at Mr. Jason Choi. This episode is also brought to you by Paraswap. Stick around to learn more. This episode is also sponsored by the HBAR Foundation. This episode is also brought to you by Notional Finance. I like to use Notional Finance to get transparent, fixed rate borrowing and lending on Ethereum. The upgraded and easy to use V2 with token and liquidity mining is also live now at notional.finance slash blockcrunch. So stick around to learn more. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. Uh, this week, we are discussing blockchain space. Now, blockchain space is building a platform for guilds, and they recently raised a round from Spartan, Animoca, and have the founders of both Axie Infinity and Yield Guild as their advisors as well. So I'm very excited to understand more about how play-to-earn guilds differentiate, how they're going to develop, what they do. And also, since I'm personally massively bullish on Asia-based ecosystem, We'll also touch on what's happening in the Asia crypto gaming ecosystem as well. So to talk about all this, I'm really excited to join by Blockchain Space's founder, Peter. So welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you very much for having me, Jason. Awesome to be here. Definitely. Now, just to kind of get us started, can you explain to the listeners what exactly are you working on with the Blockchain Space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I have to say that our sales pitch has kind of um, evolved quite a bit. Uh, in the last couple of months. And so even myself, I'm a little bit confused, but um, I think uh, primarily you can see us as kind of three things. Uh, So firstly, uh, we're a guild education hub to kind of get people into the space, um, like get more guilds. Uh, And then secondly, um, we are uh, a tool provider in terms of like helping guilds uh, to scale up uh, using kind of automation through ERP solutions, accounting solutions um, and uh, performance uh, solutions. And then finally, uh, the last is really financial solutions, which is um, we want to be able to, based on that data, extend uh, financial services that make sense to the guild so that they can actually scale. Um, So, well, our tagline is really all about empowering guilds uh, in the open metaverse. And uh, that's really our advocacy. That's really interesting. And how did you kind of come up with this idea? You know, what 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 were the pain points that you saw when you surveyed this uh, guild ecosystem? Yeah, so um, I'd have to say, I mean, it was all quite grassroots. Um, so I actually came from the space myself. Uh, I was one of the first Axie scholarship programs in the world. Um, uh, kind of like watching kind of like the other pioneers, how they did it. Um, so I think I was like, uh, within the top 10, like, uh, first ones that kind of started up last year around September in 2020. Um, I've actually been in the Axie ecosystem since, uh, 2018, since I met Jiho and Gabby, uh, back in the Philippines, uh, meetup. So I, I actually, um, I have a co-working space where we used to host a lot of meetups and uh, Gabby actually invited um, Axie Infinity to our our space where we actually hosted the first ever Axie meetup in the Philippines. So that's one of those proud moments that we can reflect on. And because I was um, following Axie so intently over the years, and I have to say, like, I'm not a huge gamer myself. Um, so I, I, a lot of like the game mechanics and like the, you know, understanding cards uh, within the game, you know, didn't. Uh, make a lot of sense to me, or uh, maybe I didn't study it uh, well enough, right? And um, uh, but I did uh, kind of follow, like, kind of as soon as there was kind of like a business model, and I saw people kind of uh, with their assets starting to loan those out and actually start to get kind of side income. That's the part that really piqued my interest, right? So um, uh, as a crypto educator you know, uh, in the Philippines for about three years now. So since 2018, I've been extending my co-working space for blockchain meetups. And um, that's how kind of uh, the whole crypto community um, in the Philippines know each other is uh, really through kind of networking and having beers and pizza together. And um, I was basically... 
uh, always advocating, you know, adoption of this technology to kind of uh, new people. Um, and, and we would kind of do road shows and uh, meet, you know, uh, kind of communities within schools or within um, other kind of communities within communities. Like, so whether, whether there are clubs or societies, you know, uh, we would go and speak and like educate people. And uh, it, it, when the Axie scholarship model came out, you know, it was the first time I actually felt confident that uh, without actually having to persuade them to use the technology, set up wallets, learn how to kind of uh, make exchange trades, right, um, that they actually wanted to get into the system and, uh, you know, to, uh, learn about the technology through uh, different means. So basically what happened with Axie scholarships is... Um, people who uh, understood the business model really well. It was um, something that was really simple that kind of, um, uh, kind of, uh, I guess, related to your average person, which was if you have 10 game accounts, then you can loan those out to your friends. And then at the end of the month, uh, we will cut uh, the earnings into commission splits um, that uh, are basically agreeable to the owner and the, per- and the lender. Right. And um, that was really, really simple for some reason. I, I guess um, in the Philippines that a lot of this kind of loaning system already exists as well. And then uh, what I saw was basically a proliferation of like these uh, Axie scholarships um, within my own social circles. And then from then, I kind of right, got really bullish, knew that you know, these um, Axie scholarships are going to be for the the, the non-crypto natives and probably for the mass people. Yeah, and you're based in the Philippines, which is obviously in the epicenter of, uh, or one of the epicenters for this entire new play-to-earn ecosystem or this phenomenon. Um, so I'm curious, you know, in terms of how big this opportunity is and in, in terms of how, how big the opportunity space for guilds is, how do you kind of reason about that? It's because my understanding is most of the guilds right now are still mostly servicing X Infinity. You know, a lot of the play-to-earn ecosystem still revolves around the one game. You know, what other developments are you seeing out there? Yeah, so I mean, like, I just for Axie alone, I actually I see so much growth potential already. Um, so if you actually have a look at our Guild Insights report, uh, which is actually live in our Gitbook right now, so you go to blockchainspace.gitbook.io. Um, you can actually see that we we monitor 2,700 guilds around the world right now, and that you can see the average guild is actually uh, very small. So in terms of community members, the average guild in the world has around 380 uh, members in their Discord. And then in terms of like how many uh, scholar accounts, they have only around eight scholars within their program, meaning that the average guild is actually only a, a micro scholarship right? Um, it only has eight accounts that they're managing. And so I, I see this growth basically driven by your average kind of like um, uh, entrepreneur, someone with, you know, a disposable cash of like between like five to $10,000, right? Which is kind of like within reason, uh, well, within reach, I guess, of like uh, a lot of people. And so, um, yeah, the, the, these micro entrepreneurs are just kind of proliferating just because of it. I guess the, the uh, investment size is actually uh, not too big of a hurdle. Um, and um, I actually see like within the Axie ecosystem itself that, you know, uh, we're starting to see network effects. So if you think about it, you know, if let's say myself, if I tell three people about Axie scholarships and now today you have around... 3,000 uh, guilds around the world that are talking about Axie scholarships, and they tell three people. We're starting to get these network effects where each one tells three people, and then these guilds just start popping up like all around the place. Right. So actually, I see like a lot of growth for Axie just coming from, you know, the the micro guilds. Um, uh, yeah, that 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 might be in the space. From the other games. Um, it's hard to say right now because um, I know a lot of guilds are trying out uh, different games, but there is not a single game I would say that has kind of like dominated the guild space yet. You know, I think everyone's trying to um, in terms of like you know penetration of guilds, 
you know, um, but I, I'm sure no one has that one central database which tells you, oh, here are all the 3,000 guilds around the world uh, other than us right now. So, I, so um, you know, there is, uh, yeah, there, there is a lot of value in being able to identify who those guilds are. And um, guilds are basically the best friends of all those NFT games that are coming up. Right. They, of course, like uh, we, we are pretty much the target market and um, uh, for all of these games. And you can be very specific now uh, and say, like, um, looking at our own reports, you know, you can you can pick regions where you want to be able to identify guilds. So whether it's in the U.S., Asia, South America, uh, Africa or, or Southeast Asia, right, um, you can actually identify which guilds you want to work with. And so I see that. You know, this this is going to be an, an essential part uh, for growth of these new NFT games coming up. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that there hasn't been a single game that you know really penetrated all the guilds because um, my impression was always that Axie Infinity is kind of the game that uh, every guild is servicing, uh, if not the only game that some guilds are servicing. Um, is is that perspective wrong? Are there like new games that are on the horizon or that are live already that maybe I'm missing? No, I I completely agree with that. Um, I think the the whole reason guilds even exist right now is because of Axie, right? Um, and for sure, um, I, as a wild guess right at this stage, because we don't have the the exact number, but I mean, uh, all the guilds that we monitor, we monitor them because they play Axie, right? Um, so we need that number uh, for all the non Axie guilds out there. Uh, there probably are some. Uh, we know that some people have contacted us. Uh, it's telling us like they only focus on Solala based games, or uh, mm-hmm. they might be only focusing on like uh, like uh, some kind of other NFT projects. So, um, uh, but I would say the majority of them are kind of um, uh, not very mature yet, uh, like as in like very well established, you know, and um, they're probably very few. Now, uh, the reason for this is quite simply, you know, the Axie scholarship business model is uh, kind of tried and proven, you know, and so it's kind of like been battle tested for a while now. So there's, um, you know, there is proof that you can actually get ROI from running an Axie scholarship um, uh, today. Yeah, and let's take a step back and talk about guilds as a concept. Um, and for listeners who are interested, you can check out our YGG episode where we talk to Gabby from Yield Guild Games, and we're going to go deeper into this. Um, but just to give some context here, you know, where did the idea of guilds come from and what do they actually do? So my reference that I, I always like to think about actually is I, I actually go to Wikipedia and I, um, I had a look um, and I even shared this with my own investors is uh, I think I, I, I I basically researched uh, what what is a guild, and then it goes back to you know artisanal days and about um, how guilds used to get together as informal kind of uh, parties uh, to aggregate you know feedback uh, and uh, kind of collaborate together um, f- uh, to be able to you know create change and propose change to governments, right? And so um, I think that's kind of uh, a uh, part of uh, where these guilds are coming from because uh, right now actually if you have a look at the Axie scholarship model uh, the fact that so many people came into these Axie scholarships um, but then um, at the same time Axie actually doesn't endorse um, the scholarship model itself right uh, there I, I think for various different reasons like it's not that they don't realize the growth is coming from guilds it's rather that you know if it becomes an official part of their business, then, you know, it's a lot, it's, uh, it, it's quite a lot for them to handle, right? So uh, what's happening is that a lot of self-organization is happening um, in the guild space where people are like, this is a great business model, but you know what? There is um, a complete lack of kind of like uh, feedback uh, that we can actually provide. And so uh, people are kind of uh, collaborating and, and getting together and discussing you know, um, uh, these are my concerns, like, what about you? And then people would share tools with each other, you know, and um, uh, yeah, and, you know, every time there is a game uh, game mechanic change, um, you know, these guild owners would get together and kind of like uh, try and kind of through a community spirit, you know, uh, get together and uh, uh, see um, how to kind of deal with changes. 
right? And I think that's because uh, that 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 part of that market is just not catered to in the actual Axie platform itself yet, right? Um, on the other side, like why do these guilds actually exist, right? So uh, you you know what what we're seeing right now is like you know ultimately I like to define at its simplest form a guild as a community. Right, and uh, this particular guild is like focused on play to earn games. So these are play to earn guilds, right? And these uh, communities are basically all pretty much gamers, right? So, um, so the way I see it is like uh, these they are groups. They are guilds or groups of gamers um, that are in a specific you know community, um, and that specific community could be anywhere in the world. Or any like any locality, right? And um, uh, and these basically these communities can be mobilized, right? So like you know you'll have a guild head, which basically says like, hey guys, this is my our the mission of our guild. If you align with this mission, uh, then we you know we can achieve these goals together, right? And that's kind of how you build that community. Absolutely, and now most guilds revolve around uh, Axie's play-to-earn system, the scholarship model, uh, where basically you need to have some upfront cost uh, in order to play the Axie game. Right, you need to buy the the Axie NFTs, and many people aren't uh, aren't able to afford this, and that's why guilds exist to kind of lend them these NFT assets so that they can start playing. But this scholarship model, as you mentioned, is not necessarily um, something that every play-to-earn game out there adopts. So how do you see guilds evolving to accommodate a wider uh, variety of games? Yeah, so that's why I always like to talk about guilds as opposed to, you know, just Axie scholarships, because Axie scholarships is just one business model that guilds are adopting right now just for Axie the game, right? Um, it was actually, I guess, the, the even the term scholarships came from, you know, um, uh, the ability basically to be able to fund someone else, right? The idea was like, you know, you like just like a scholar in education, you could fund someone else uh, and, and basically uh, pay pay it forward, right? To, to allow someone to have another opportunity without uh, having for them to having to put any money down. Now, um, I think that same ethos is going to happen where, um, you know, there are basically guild owners, or let's say communities where people have uh, their own NFT assets, right? And um, <clears throat> they want to pay it forward uh, to you know the larger community, like uh, people, especially in developing countries, which are in uh, less fortunate circumstances, right? And uh, they want to be able to give that opportunity for people that who you know they want to put in the time to basically you know to uh, be able to earn using those in-game economies. Right. Um, so the way I see it is like there are going to be many business models um, popping up, even within Axie itself. So the Axie scholarship program, I think, is very specific to the loaning of Axies to uh, people who want to play with those Axies to play PVE and PVP. Um, but even uh, when LAN play comes out, it's going to be a different model. Right. So you, you've got land. Uh, you'll have Axie landowners and uh, they will basically want to, uh, I, I, we don't know the exact mechanics yet, but I assume they will want to <clears throat> rent out their land like a landlord, right? Um, and allow other people basically to build on top of it and to basically collect like taxes, you know, from basically anyone that's building on the land, just like in real life, right? So I can definitely see that as one a uh, business model that may evolve uh, out of this space. Um, the same comes with like the games like uh, the Sandbox, for instance, where you know you have the the primary focus right now is on land ownership. And there's like three hundred thousand land plots uh, in the Sandbox metaverse, right? And so um, each of these landowners basically want to be able to monetize their land in the future, and this land is becoming very very valuable. Um, uh, it's done multiple X's like uh, in the last year. Uh, and people kind of like see the opportunity that, you know, just like in, let's say in Roblox, right, which is non-crypto, you know, you can have basically uh, lots of different uh, game experiences that are built um, um, and they call the, in Roblox, it's like, it's called a different server, 
But in um, in the sandbox, each LAN basically will represent a different server, right? And so you basically go f- to each LAN for a different experience. And of course, like some landowners, they probably won't want to monetize at all. They just want to give a free experience. Uh, but some will want to, you know, provide entertainment value or, you know, will 100% want to monetize. And you see even like you know, those big, big name companies, like traditional companies like Adidas, now coming into the sandbox metaverse with, you know, uh, big plans to be able to monetize there too. Now, before I continue, I'd love to share one of my favorite products in crypto with you. Now, whenever I want to trade a token, instead of going to Uniswap, SushiSwap, Bancor, one by one to see where I can find the best quote, I just go to Paraswap to scan for the best price anywhere. Because Paraswap aggregates all the popular Ethereum DEXs and saves me a ton of time and headache in finding where I can trade something for the best price and lets me trade in one place. Now the cool thing is they've also integrated with Ledger Live as well, meaning I can now swap at the best prices directly from my Ledger wallet. So seriously, if you are a DeFi trader and you're worried about the security risks of centralized exchanges, but you also don't want to scour dozens of DEXs just to find the best price, you have to check out Paraswap. So head on over to paraswap.io slash blockcrunch. I'd also love to take a moment to talk about the HBAR Foundation. Now, if you approached me one to two years ago, I would tell you I'm really skeptical of layer one systems outside of Ethereum. But in the past 12 months, I started to notice billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of users flocking to new blockchains left and right. And then I realized there's an actual market gap being filled. And I always love to support projects who support builders. And one of those projects is Hedera Hashgraph. Hedera is an enterprise-grade public network with its own crypto asset called HBAR. And the HBAR Foundation has launched with an initial budget of over $2 billion to provide entrepreneurs with the funding and ecosystem support needed to quickly build and deploy new applications on the Hedera Hashgraph network. The HBAR Foundation is eager to find builders in DeFi, NFTs, gaming, sustainability, and all sectors. So if you are a builder, a developer, or a creator with an idea, visit hbarfoundation.org to learn more. I'd love to talk a little bit about Notional. If you follow the show for long enough, you know I'm pretty excited about fixed rate products. Notional Finance is the leading fixed rate borrowing and lending protocol, and they've just released a major upgrade. With Notional, you can not only borrow and lend at fixed rates for up to one year now, but liquidity providers also have a pretty good opportunity. Thanks to an integration with Compound and a liquidity mining program, LPs can actually earn interest, liquidity fees, and token liquidity mining incentives as well. We've talked with Teddy from Notional recently, and as a happy investor as well, I've been pretty impressed with how the team is building this critical infrastructure that will help onboard the next billion users to DeFi. So you can check it out today at notional.finance slash blockcrunch. That's really interesting. And I guess that ties into my other question, which is, you know, for the investors out there, or even for yourself, right, before you started blockchain space, uh, what, what beliefs do you need to hold in order to think that this guild opportunity is a big one. I do have to believe that you know, um, you know, ninety percent of the games are going to take place in the metaverse. There's going to be a massive wave of play-to-earn games. Or what were the kind of core tenets that you need to abide by in order to really buy into this guild thesis? Yeah. So, I mean, um, gosh, that that is a great question. So, I mean. Um, that, that I guess there's a lot of people that have kind of started in the NFT space, right? That did very well, right? And um, you know they've accumulated; they, they're so bullish already in NFTs uh, from an early stage that you know that I, I guess that might be one of the the very first uh, core tenets, right? Is if you mm-hmm. believe in NFTs, then you believe in yield bearing NFTs, right? And so this is a chance for you to basically yield bear on on those nft assets right and so um a lot of these um axie owners um they got into axie very very early on and what attracted them most was not just you know the the graphics and the team and and so on but the fact that you know these are single unique uh uh digital assets right and that you know you can trade them they actually lock in real value right in this economy and that um you know they they they're, they're bullish on the fact that these NFTs uh, will retain value or even appreciate in value over time, right? And so um, this is one part that I absolutely love about Axie, and um, I guess like not enough people talk about it, right? So I think Axie only created something like the first 
uh, 10,000 axes in the whole game. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like uh, that, that number might be incorrect. But, um, uh, but the principle is correct. So basically, they only created the first axes, and then uh, they did not print any more of the game characters any, uh, after that. Right? And then basically, all the axes that people are playing with today are actually created by the community. Right, so this is a very much community-driven, community-owned game and ecosystem, or an economy. Right, it's um, I I've never seen anything quite like it. That's it's it's really breathtaking and mind-blowing. The the fact that what they did is they kind of like turned game ownership on its head and said, um, so where you had like owners of like the game like Fortnite. You know where the game developer just brings out unlimited assets in the game, uh, but ultimately they own everything, and anything inside their game economy is owned by them as well. And then all you're doing is basically pouring in money into buy new skins. In this case, it's the opposite. They've said, "Look, guys, we're going to just give you the template for how to create uh, the in-game assets, but you guys are going to be the ones to create the assets yourself." Through a mechanism called breeding, right? And so, uh, you know, the community got together and basically bred all these axes. So, if we have three million players today, and it's you know at least three axes per an account, we've got at least nine million axes out there that have been created. Now, just think about that. If Axie only created the first ten thousand, yeah, you know, how many were created by the community is just absolutely mind blowing. And so um, this is where I see kind of like the core value being from is this community ownership, right? That, um, you know, the community basically is massively bullish in NFTs. And then, you know, they not only this, they've seen like game development being, you know, uh, spun on its head. And then, uh, you know, they, they feel like they own the game. The community owns the game. You know, it's not Axie that owns the game. Absolutely. That's an incredibly powerful idea. And I know a lot of gamers and investors alike are really captivated by this new paradigm. And I'm curious, you know, Peter, you mentioned that there's 2,700 guilds, which is, you know, a crazy number, especially given how nascent this space is. So based on what you're seeing so far, you know, what are the main ways that guilds differentiate from one another? You know, what can a guild do to stand out from the crowd? Yeah. So, yeah, that's a great question as well. So, I mean, of, of course, you've got your really large, I, I call them macro guilds. It's a really boring term. Uh, and then you've got micro guilds. So macro guilds being the ones like YGG, Merit Circle, Unix Gaming, um, uh, Avocado Guilds. You know, these guys are kind of playing the bigger the bigger picture. Um, you know, they are trying to be like absolutely massive. They have a very different strategy, right, in terms of like a mono, like a, um like monetary policy or uh, you know how investment thesis. So a lot of these guys try to get into SAFs, right? They go into like uh, they'll they'll speak to NFT games and and as they're in development and they'll try and get into private sales and try and make money through that. Or they will um, uh, aggregate kind of NFTs into their treasury um, so that their treasury becomes more valuable over time by accumulating assets, right? So that's um, that's kind of like a lot of the primary focus of these like macro guilds and they're not so focused on the revenue that's being uh, driven from the actual scholarship programs themselves right that might be kind of like the smaller part of uh, you know their uh, revenue stream now when you look at like micro guilds it's the opposite right for micro guilds it's your your lifeline is basically your scholars right the accounts and their performance right and it's not about uh, I mean Yes, you invested in uh, the NFTs, but you only invested in eight, uh, eight accounts, right? So it's not a huge number of NFTs. And so like, uh, you know, it, even if it does go up, it doesn't, it might not be as much as the, the value that you're getting out from, you know, basically uh, farming this yield uh, from the SLP token in Axie, for instance, right? So uh, for them, the, the focus is very much on, you know, m- maintaining and managing those accounts. Um, how do they differentiate? So, uh, lots of different unique ways, I guess, like, um, uh, I've, I've seen, uh, celebrities start up guilds, uh, where it's just uh, pure, like, you know, uh, fandom, like for, 
um, for celebrities. So if you want to, you know, be a part of the celebrities community, um, then you would join that guild. Um, I've seen guilds that are hundred percent, uh, just focus on, you know, empowering local communities. So it's, uh, focused on a specific geography. So because there are so many people trying to get in this space and there's actually the account creation process is actually, uh, too slow. Um, there's a lot of people in the backlog right now. And so, um, a lot of people, uh, tend to kind of like filter their onboarding process to, uh, something that's meaningful to them. And what we're seeing is like, just like I said earlier, like how micro guilds are very individual and personal, you know, you start to see these micro guilds kind of focusing on personal advocacy or like, uh, local communities, right. Something that's kind of relatable to them. So an idea is like, you know, um, you know, in the Philippines alone, I think there's probably over a thousand guilds, right. And, um, some of them just focus literally on their own, what we call like a barangay, which is like a local, uh, count town or count, uh, council, right. And it's might only be like a thousand people. Right. But that's enough because they can't cater to more than a thousand people anyway. Right. So, um, you know, you might see like hyper localization, uh, happening right now. Thank you for that. And I guess in terms of, um, the guilds that you work with earlier, you mentioned that you provide data and also financing for a lot of the guilds through blockchain space. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you work with guilds and, um, you know, what are the main bottlenecks that you're seeing guilds face that you're solving? Yeah, sure. So again, like I just want to reiterate, like the long tail of the industry is basically micro guilds, right? So I I always love this data point, right? So if you look at uh, Axie numbers today, so they're coming up to 3 million daily active users right now. And we know that around 30% of them at least are coming from the Philippines alone. Now we know that in the Philippines, uh, the majority of players cannot afford their own accounts because uh, uh, an account is literally three hundred dollars, which is more than you know a couple of months uh, basically income. If that if they are even earning income, right? So the we know the majority of them are coming through scholarship programs. So if we look at basically uh, all those macro guilds, um, like the really big ones, um, all the YGGs, merit circles, and so on. You aggregate like kind of all their scholar numbers right now. Um, they they basically handle um, probably in total around fifty thousand accounts, right? So fifty thousand scholars. Now that may sound like a big number to people, but actually, if you have a look at it, if we consider that one million people in the Philippines, you know, are playing Axie, and we know that the majority of them are actually scholars through scholarship programs, let's say 70%, right? So then 700,000 of them are actually coming through scholarship programs. Only 50,000 of them are catered to by macro uh, guilds, right? Meaning that your average guild is actually um, really the small guilds, the micro guilds, right? They're the ones that are basically controlling the majority of the pie, right? So 650,000 accounts, basically from the Philippines alone must be handled by micro guilds. And so that's where we see basically the opportunity. Now, the question is like, um, you know, uh, how do you service that 650,000, uh, uh, you know, part of that, uh, part of the ecosystem, right? And um, so we have to kind of look very specifically to their needs, not to the macro guild needs, but the micro guild needs, right? And so if the average number of accounts is around eight, then you, you have to think like, okay, so why are you not beyond eight, right? Or why are you not at 50? Why are you not at a hundred? Um, do you want to stay at eight? Is that a really good number for you? You know, is that the amount of income that you'd like to, um, uh, stabilize at, or is the level of investment, uh, too high beyond that? And so um, from kind of like a lot of surveys that we've done, like speaking to kind of these guilds, you know, um, we realized that, you know, some of them really just don't have access to uh, capital at all, right? Um, Because you have to remember now, uh, again, like uh, us coming from developing markets, I've been here in the Philippines now for 10 years. um, uh, People in like developed markets have never seen you know, people get turned down for bank accounts, right? But I've seen it, 
Like I see uh, actually the large majority of people in the Philippines actually get turned down for bank accounts, right? And that's because they don't have credit history. There's a lot of like, let's save our cash, like the, the cash that you earn and then putting it under your bed, right? And that's, and uh, a lot of Filipinos, uh, it's also known that, you know, they, they live day by day and they're not very good at saving, right? So meaning that, you know, uh, you basically, it's very hard to get kind of credit history with uh, for the banks and the banks basically can't take on that risk um, if you don't have any kind of like history of like earnings and so on, right? So uh, now what's happened is like, instead of like this, like credit history or earnings history, uh, we, we basically caught in-game data, right? Um, that's appearing, right? So you've got basically these, these uh, gamers that are, they're basically the same people that the ones that couldn't get those bank accounts before, right? And now uh, what they're doing is that they're playing Axie every single day for like three hours a day and they'll play for like the last two, three months. We can see exactly how much they earn on a daily basis, right? And that becomes the equivalent of what banks have been looking for, which is that earnings history, right? And so from that, we can actually spin up kind of like uh, automated models which do automated credit assessment right to see whether that the, this person's base based on their performance history if they're actually credit worthy or not you know and then if we can come up with just that assessment it's very easy to plug in money on the other side like basically saying like okay this person has been earning you know five to ten thousand slp uh, per month and they say 10,000 SLP, right? This person also has a balance of 10,000 SLP, you know, in, uh, with the guild owner. Now, uh, if that person wanted to take out a loan for 5,000 SLP, no problem, right? They just have to apply through automated means. So right now we do that through a bot that's native to Discord, right? And uh, the person can speak to and say, hey, am, am I credit worthy? And it will reply yes or no. If you are, then it will tell you how much you can take out. Right. And then the issuance will actually be automated straight into a wallet. Right. From there, they basically have access to that wallet, that designated wallet that they they are the ones uh, that that designated. Right. And then there'll be another wallet where they pay back the loans. And uh, there'll be a bot that basically or, or a script that basically checks to see whether that that loan has actually been paid back or not. Right. And so yeah, that's that's basically where we're seeing like the real opportunity right now is uh, not only for um, the gamers, uh, the scholars themselves uh, that want to be able to take up loans and become uh, guild owners, but also the guild owners themselves that are at, stuck at eight accounts. You know, they can actually now uh, show their performance history to others uh, and actually get access to capital too. All right. So it sounds like uh, besides just building a a platform for guilds to monitor their data. Uh, you're also building this marketplace where investors can come basically survey all of the finances of different guilds if the guilds decide to to reveal those finances and then decide which one to invest in. Is that is that the correct way to kind of summarize the idea? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And how many guilds are you currently working with? And what, what has been the initial kind of reception? Um, so, I mean, I'd, I'd say guilds are just very, very open. Um, uh, everyone is looking for solutions, right? Um, uh, it's a very nascent space at, at this stage. So, um, there's not a single guild that's approached us that didn't want to kind of openly, uh, you know, collaborate. Uh, but then also, you know, uh, likewise, you know, anyone that we've ever approached as well, you know, there's not a single one that didn't want to work as well. And so, you know, kind of, uh, move the space forward. You know, so, um, I'd say it's a very open, collaborative uh, ecosystem right now. It's a very nascent space where people actually do take a lot of risk, right? So, um, you know, it it helps if um, others can share their stories with uh, other people so that they can kind of improve or, you know, uh, mitigate risk. Absolutely. And as we come to the final part of our discussion, I'd love to kind of learn about what your long-term growth plan is. What would you say is the roadmap to bootstrap, say, the first thousand guilds? Uh, for us personally? Yes, that's right. So, uh, yeah. So um, I, I, I have a very clear mission, actually. So um, we actually want to be able to reach 20,000 guilds by March of next year. Right? Um, I think that's highly possible. 
Uh, right now, we reach 2,700 guilds. Uh, we basically do that by providing automation and tooling. Right? Uh, it, these are just very much needed uh, right now by the guilds. Right? So um, they actually come to us uh, right now because uh, they need uh, the tooling that we provide, and we will continue to provide that for free. Right? So, um, uh, but ultimately, you know, it's not just about the tooling for us. It's about, you know, aggregating the most powerful kind of guild database um, in the world and being able to basically uh, feed that database as like a, as a guild data feed to others to basically innovate off. Right. Um, so, you know, our vision is, you know, way beyond um, just like providing tooling. Right. We want to be able to help people that like help other uh, tool makers, you know, product makers, right, to um, build uh, innovative services for the guilds as well. Right. I, I actually spoke with one of those um, service providers this morning who's looking into NFT loans. So, like, uh, you know, you'd be able to loan axes between uh, uh, different accounts. Um, and in the future, potentially between guilds into guild uh, loans, right? And that's um, that that that's like a major innovation in the space, and that's very much needed, right? And uh, uh, that 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 for me is the most compelling way, uh, basically, to onboard all of these guilds because we're working with all of them. We there's not a single guild that we. We like deem to be any like a not a com like a competitor or you know or uh, you know uh, we're very neutral in the space and uh, we just want to get as much data as possible to for other people to make informed decisions you know and uh, that 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 at this stage is like the core for us and I think that's very compelling uh, when we can when we do have this database. You know, if we are able to go to kind of like NFT game owners, like let's say, for example, like a, a game developer sets up a new play to own game in the US, they have a very strong presence in the US, but they don't have any contacts in Southeast Asia, right? And if they were able to access a directory of um, guilds in Southeast Asia that they could uh, basically engage with or mobilize, you know, that would be very, very, very powerful. Right. And, um, uh, that, you know, that, that could be for that game in particular that, you know, they might want to engage with that audience because, you know, that they might still be an alpha, for instance. Right. So that they need like game testers from the Asian region to see what the response is like from an Asian player. Right. Or they want to test out the region to see like, uh, do they play the game well? Do they understand it? Uh, or is there a language barrier? Right. And so, um, you know, there is a lot of power basically in being able to identify who those guilds are. And so that's where the way we see like onboarding for, you know, the next 20,000 guilds is you know, we need to explain clearly why it's important for these guilds to be part of this global database, right? And to be able to access those kind of opportunities. Definitely, 100%. I love that. I love the roadmap and I'm really excited to see uh, you guys onboard 20,000 guilds by next year. And in terms of socials for people who want to keep up to date with what blockchain space is working on or for guild owners who want to reach out to you or investors who want to invest in your circle of guilds, what are the best channels for them to reach out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I guess Twitter is the most active. So look for us at blockchain underscore SPC. Um, that's the official blockchain space Twitter. Um, you can follow myself individually at Peter Ng. Uh, underscore so that's peter ing underscore uh that's also on twitter and then uh check out our git book i think that's honestly the the most information is there it's really comprehensive so look at blockchain space dot git book dot io so that's blockchain space uh dot git book dot io awesome well thank you so much for taking the time peter this has been really fun yeah thank you very much jason it's been awesome great questions